attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the February 2018 Dibble webinar. It's Valentine's Day and it's our day. So I'm thrilled that you all are joining us. By a, raise, by a show of hands, this is uh, Kay Reed, the Executive Director of the Dibble Institute. How many of you have attended a Dibble webinar before? Can you raise your hand on the little, um, on, on your uh, webinar screen there? If you have, have attended a webinar before. Okay. Let me take a look here. Okay, so most of you are new. That is thrilling to have more people who have come to know about our work and today about the good work of Emily Apt, the producer and director um, of Daddy Don't Go. <clears throat> so Kathy, the next screen. Um, I wanted to introduce you to Kathy. Say hi, Kathy. Hi, it's good to be here today. So Kathy's our engineer and she'll be running the polls and turning our slides and we're really fortunate to have her on our team. Um, if, if you get cut off from the webinar, from your computer of audio, you can always call in. Uh, please type questions into the questions box. We're gonna give you some poll questions and just as I did, <clears throat> there will be some raise your hand questions. In two or three days, we will upload this webinar and all associated materials to our website so you can watch it again or you can recommend it to colleagues uh, to see again. And, and we welcome that and we know a lot of people uh, use it as a resource going on. All right, Kathy? Muted. So a little bit about Dibble since most of you are new. Um, th this is Charlie and Helen Dibble. They are the founders of the Dibble Institute. When Charlie retired from being an engineer, he started to do youth work. And what he noticed when he was working with youth is that young people's lives could often be derailed if their parents' relationships were going through tough times, or if their own relationship, their own youthful love, you know, they made some poor decisions. So he started doing research, this was in the late 80s, to find out what could be done and there was lots of research about relationships, romance, and marriage. But when he asked those evaluators what they knew about helping young people get smart about their love lives, they really said, we aren't doing anything. It's really a hard thing to, you know, hard young, it's hard to reach young people. So he took it upon himself to say, I can fix that. In the early 90s, and Kathy, the next slide, the Dibble Institute was established. And since then, we have reached literally millions of young people with a Dibble Institute, research-based, best-practiced, evidence-based program around the country and even into some um, foreign countries. We estimate, based on last year's data, that every day, 200 or more youth are learning how to get smart about their love lives with a Dibble program. And we don't do the direct services, our clients do those services, and to them for their good work in reaching young people in the prison system, in schools, in foster care, and many other settings, uh, we are indebted, uh, really, really indebted, and we thank you. The next slide. So a little bit more about the Dibble Institute and, and our core values. Uh, the first is we believe in research. We are science-based. So when we write materials, it's not based on any ideology, it's based on what we know in the field. So we believe in research, we use it, we incorporate it into our materials, and we also make sure that our materials are evaluated so we understand what happens um, for young people once they finish a Dibble program. We have lots of webinars on that, so I won't go into that here, but just know that we're based in science. All righty, the next one. We're big fans. We're big, big fans of uh, stable and healthy families. Um, but we also, so two things we understand. <clears throat> One, there are countless single parents every day getting up, doing the hard work of raising children. And they are to be credited with, you know, they're incredible people doing incredible work. But when you talk to them, they would 
probably tell you, most of them would probably tell you that it's really tough. It's really tough to raise kids on your own. Tough financially, tough physically, tough socially, tough psychologically. It's just tough. And many of them wish they'd made different choices. So uh, when we talk about, in, uh, about having stables, families with children raised by their own two parents, we by no means need, uh, are disrespecting those hardworking single parents, but we also know that <clears throat> it's tough and they would probably make it different. The other thing is that there is no place for abuse against self, others, uh, substances, violence in a, in a family relationship. And so while we, again, we're big fans of strong, intact families, uh, if there is violence, it's best for children, and best for women, best for men, if that relationship, you know, gets help or gets dissolved, um, but, is, but is resolved for sure. So we don't have any tolerance for violence, and we deeply respect the hard work that single parents are doing. The next slide. And finally, we believe that everyone needs to be treated with respect and that every relationship can be improved with relationship skills. So we intentionally write our materials to be inclusive of diverse youth, of diverse orientations, um, because we know that every young people, every young person uh, can use help in understanding how romantic lives work and um, why, why romantic lives matter, why love life matters. So next slide. So I'd like to uh, present Emily App today. Let me uh, just tell you why we invited her onto our webinar, because I think it's important that we make this connection. <clears throat> um, because we understand that there are, are so many fathers who aren't connected to their children, who want to do a good job, and yet it's just sometimes hard for them to stay as involved as they would like. And we believe that often, not all the time, but often their romantic and their other relationships impact how they connect to their children and how they connect to their partners. So we uh, you know, can make several assumptions that fathers want to stay involved with their children's lives, most fathers do, but to do that, fathers need to have good relationships with their co-parents uh, to, and be able to speak respectfully, solve problems, work together. We often also know that many fathers will have a second or more relationships with other partners. And so those relationships could be better, could be stronger, so they lasted. Um, and that's when we read books like by Kathy Eden, and if you have not read her book, um, Doing the Best I Can, I highly recommend it, and I know uh, Emily will talk about it as well, uh, she really makes the case that these young men want to do the best by their by their families and by their children, but sometimes they just don't know how. So the reason we bring the fatherhood discussion here today is while relationships are not the only lever you need to pull with young fathers, it certainly is an important lever to pull with young fathers. And we have our programs being used in fatherhood programs across the country. So that's that just to make that connection, probably most of you had already figured that out. But without uh, further ado, we'll talk more about this later, but without further ado, we'd like to get started uh, showing you, or having Emily uh, start the show. Kathy? muted. Okay, Emily. Hi, everybody. I am so honored and delighted to be speaking with you today. And uh, I'm a huge fan of the Dibble Institute and the incredible work they do. Um, it's, you know, of great personal value to me, uh, the service they're providing and the information they're spreading. So I just couldn't be happier uh than than to be with you all today and i'm just uh really thrilled to be directly connecting with so many people that are you know doing this work that i deeply care about um which is you know direct service work with disadvantaged dads 
Um, and I quite honestly, I, I made this film for you. Um, I absolutely made it for you. I, I am a former caseworker myself and I've spent a, spent a lot of time with uh, disadvantaged families over the years. And um, so I'm kind of intimately familiar with some of the issues you guys are grappling with. And my turn to filmmaking was sort of a direct extension um, from my public service work and my commitment to public service work. And so when you see Daddy Don't Go, I hope that you see my caseworker heart <laughs> in, uh, in the film and that that really comes through. So I'm speaking to you with the you know, deepest uh, respect and um, admiration for the hard work that you do. Um, just a note about who I am and who I'm not and that perspective from which I'm gonna be speaking from. Uh, I am a former caseworker, but that was many, many years ago. I've been uh, an independent filmmaker for 20 years now. I've made five feature films, many of which have you know strong sort of social justice themes. But um, that's the perspective that I'm speaking from. I'm not a policy expert. Um, unlike yourselves, I'm not out in the field on a daily basis interacting directly with disadvantaged dads. Um, but I do think, you know, I have some insights to offer because it took us five years to make this film. Um, and in making it, I did really get to know these four men very, very deeply. Um, and, you know, got to know their, their sort of circles as well. And that means the, the caseworkers, the lawyers, all those kind of folks that they were dealing with, and of course their families. Um, so that's really the perspective that I'm speaking from. And, uh, you know, just a little bit about the film. It did take five years to make. It was uh, not an easy film to make financially. Um, you know, we, the team that put it together, all had other jobs throughout production. Um, you know, financing was slim. But we made the film uh, because the issue of fatherlessness and disadvantaged dads really resonated uh, for each of us on a very personal level. Um, okay, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and like I said, so the film uh, took us about five years to make, and we shot over a period of three years, roughly three years. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, the team behind the film and how we came together in a minute. But first, let me tell you about the dads themselves, because uh, these are very, very compelling individuals. Um, it took us about six months to cast the film. And I use the term casting because um, a lot of people think that with documentaries, you know, they're not really directed and they're just sort of these pieces of journalism that fall from the sky. Um, and these guys, you know, probably just walked into our lives, but it's not like that at all. Uh, the casting process um, takes a long time and you really have to know what you're looking for. And um, we basically reached out to you know, over a dozen father-friendly organizations in New York City um, and told them that we wanted to make this film. Um, and we knew that the, the film's success sort of lived and died with the strength of our characters um, and with the strength of, of these dads that we were looking for. And um, we found a great partner in the Bronx Defenders and they were super supportive of the story we were trying to tell and got back to us right away and said, we know these men, we know them. And uh, we did indeed find uh, three of the fathers through the Bronx Defenders. And um, we were looking for men who 
had really difficult circumstances, you know, great personal disadvantages that they were grappling with, but were deeply committed to their children and, and to being good fathers. Um, so that's what you very much see in each of these stories. Um, and then Roy, we found him actually through Alex, ironically. Um, Alex and Roy went to, uh, went to a mechanic school together. Um, and so Alex came from the Bronx Defenders. He had just gotten full custody of his son. He was homeless at the time. Um, and we started filming him. And then about three months into his story, uh, we discovered that he also had this pending criminal case. And so uh, after a lot of hard access work with the help of our pro bono attorneys, we were able to um, follow his story in Bronx Criminal Court as well. And uh, Judge Patricia Domingo, who you see in the film, who comes across as a real battle ax, um, you know, thankfully really understood and appreciated the story we were trying to tell and allowed us to have access uh, to the courtroom to be able to fully tell Alex's story. And Alex was very brave as well. You know, there's not a lot of people out there who would be willing to have a camera on them for three years, especially while they're going through the kind of things that he was. Um, so he was incredibly brave to let us film him. Um, Nelson really blew us away right away. Uh, he's a very warm, charismatic, uh, funny guy. And I think what we found really powerful about his story was that he was fathering children who weren't biologically his own. And I've always been very moved by guys like this. I'm sure all of you have come across men like this um, in your work, but to me, you know, it's one thing to raise your own children. It's another thing to raise somebody else's and it just takes a special kind of person to step up in that way. And Nelson was just 100% committed uh, uh, to his daughters and that's how he refers to them um, and really made no distinction between the kids in the family that were his own biologically and those that weren't. So we, we instantly loved him for that. Um, and uh, his story, you know, was a very powerful one to watch unfold as well. Um, Omar um, was, was in very difficult circumstances when we first started filming him. And sadly, things just went from sort of bad to worse in a lot of ways. Um, but Omar remained very dedicated to his children um, throughout the filming. And I think one of the powerful things about his story is that he personally was, was dealing with some mental disabilities and issues, a lot of um, past trauma that he was trying to work through. And he was also trying to um, help his children with similar issues. And Milagros, who you see pictured here, uh, was definitely suffering the most during the time of filming. And that stuff was very sensitive access wise um, and, and difficult, but everybody was very courageous, uh, including Milagros herself. And I'm, I'm very thankful that we got to tell this story um, in, in all of its complexity. Uh, that brings me to Roy. Uh, it was very important to us in making this film that we had you know, racial diversity. Um, you know, this issue of disadvantaged fathers and fatherlessness it is um, not one that afflicts a particular race. Um, uh, exclusively. And um, we, in my work, I always try and challenge stereotypes. And, you know, the biggest group of uh, single dads and disadvantaged dads, um, absent dads, the, you know, the biggest 
racial group there are, are white men. Um, so it was very important to us to have a, a Caucasian father represented. Um, and some at first took issue with the fact that he was more middle class than the rest of the dads. Um, but I thought his story was so powerful and you know, told, captured so many things we wanted to touch on and that he you know, was formerly incarcerated and dealing with the hardship of trying to find a job after that. He uh, had sole custody because Kane's mother was um, a drug addict. And we didn't want to be too explicit about this in the film just for privacy reasons, but she was an active heroin addict and that's why she was not uh, present in Kane's life. And so there was um, a lot of hardship in Roy's story that we thought sort of mitigated the fact that he was more middle class. And again, this issue affects people of all races, all classes. So we really wanted that sort of universality um, to be reflected in the in the demographics of our of our cast. Um, so the, that's a little bit about our four dads and how we found them. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the team, a little bit more about the team. It's okay if you go to the next slide, please. So uh, you see the four sort of main team members at the top of the page. That's uh, Karen Thompson, Andrew Namchul, Osborne, Suzette Burton, and myself. And um, this team was sort of uniquely qualified to bring this film to life. Um, like I said, there was there was really no money for us. We we basically worked on, on the film for free for many years. Um, and the reason that we were able to do that uh, and the thing that sort of sustained us was a, a really deep and personal commitment to the issue. Um, for Karen and Andrew, they were both adopted. Um, they're not brother and sister, but they, they happen to both be adopted. Um, and both of them were very, very close to their adopted fathers. And so fatherhood, fathering, what that meant had a sort of special and unique meaning for them. And sadly, Karen's father was sort of slowly passing away um, from leukemia during the production of the film. And she really was extremely committed to the film in part uh you know out of love for her father um and suzette uh suzette grew up without a dad her father was murdered when she was a teenager and she never really got to know him and she herself was sort of in and out of the foster care system and this is all if you ever meet suzette you'll be blown away by her and even more blown away by her now that you know that she definitely didn't have an easy childhood. But obviously the issue of fatherlessness really spoke to her personally. Um, and for me, um, my, my dad is a refugee from Nazi Germany. And when he came to this country, um, you know, it was him, his dad, his mom, you know, they barely escaped. They didn't go to the camps or anything. But when they came to New York, they were very poor, uh, without resources. And basically, my dad's, uh, his, his parents' marriage fell apart sort of under the pressure. And this happens a lot, sadly, with immigrant families. Um, and the last time my father saw his father was um, in family court. And, and I, I tell you this story because it was such an important story. I think every family has their stories. And this, this story was told many times to me and uh, I th think really shaped my father. And basically he was, his, his parents had separated um, because his father really couldn't earn any kind of living. And there was, you know, uh, some, some domestic violence that took place between his parents and uh, basically his mom kicked out his dad. And then his dad showed up in court um, and, you know, the judge asked him, he said, you know, don't you love your son? Why aren't you paying child support? And, and uh, 
at that time, basically you weren't allowed to see your child uh, or fathers weren't allowed to see their children unless they paid child support. And, you know, we still see versions of this today, but, I, you know, thankfully it's kind of changed. But my, my grandfather who couldn't speak English, um, but did in fact love his son, he held out the empty pockets of his pants to show the judge that he had no money. Um, and so that's why he couldn't see my dad. And my dad was only eight years old at the time. Uh, and his, his mo mother, and we'll touch on this later, but his mother was you know, telling him a lot of bad things about his dad and he was very confused. Um, and the judge turned to him and said, you know, uh, do you want to see your father? And my dad said, no. And he said, the judge said, well, how could that be? You know, he's your father, don't you love him? And my dad said, no. And sadly, that was the last time he saw him. And my grandfather then died uh, alone and impoverished, um, you know, a year later. And the reason I tell you all this is because um, my dad then became, you know, years later, a very, very devoted father. And when I was a caseworker, I saw a lot of men, I met a lot of men that really reminded me of my dad in that they didn't have fathers themselves, but because of that, were all the more determined to be good dads. And I met men like this over and over again when I was a caseworker, and it really stuck with me. And I said, you know, this, this whole, and this was like in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s, but basically I started to really despise this whole dead be dead stereotype because uh, it just didn't fit with the reality that I was witnessing. And because I had this very personal family story uh, that really defined my father and, and defined me, you know, my father was an amazing dad to me in part because of his own the, the absence that he experienced himself. And so that was really what moved me to, to make the film Against the Odds. And uh, about two years into production, we, I have a, a big Hollywood agent um, and, uh, and she connected me with Omar Epps because he was uh, a client at the same agency um, at ICM. And he was in the process of writing a book about being fatherless uh, but having children himself. And basically he uh, had done some activism around the issue of fatherlessness. And so my agent saw a natural connection there. Um, Omar saw an early cut of the film, loved it. Uh, was just like, what can I do to support this? And so we were off to the races um, and he was an incredible executive producer, uh, super supportive, you know, helped us in, in many different ways. Um, and then we also connected with Malik Yoba, who's done a lot of uh, activism around this issue in the New York City area where he resides. Um, and he has three children as well. Omar has three kids too. Um, and he, 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 you know, between us, um, <laughs> had, you know, a lot of drama with uh, one of the mothers of his children and they were in and out of court. And he's actually very open about this. He's talked about it in the press before, um, but it was very difficult. Um, and he really um, fought for his kids basically and fought to be a present father and, and is very, very much that. So he's, the, both these actors are not just actors, they're activists and they're fathers who are deeply, deeply engaged in this issue on a personal level, but also on a political one. And so they were amazing to have involved. Um, and I already told you about me. So, okay, next slide. Um, so in making this film, we did a lot of work to prove to funders um, and to anyone who would listen that this is a really, really important issue. And this right here is one of the most powerful statistics that I 
uh, or not statistics, but just pieces of information that I came across in doing that research. And basically the, the sort of most important thing to take away from this is that um, not having a dad uh, just places kids at much higher risk to live in poverty, do badly in school, become incarcerated. Um, and I want to mention here that I in no way am uh, mean this as any kind of put down of uh, same-sex lesbian couples. Uh, what I'm talking about in terms of fatherlessness is I'm talking about um, you know, the absence of a dad who, who was there at some point um, and, and how deeply scarring that is to a child. Um, I think, and I think it, it, it's about the importance of two parent families. Um, so, you know, this isn't meant, none of my work is meant at all to disrespect or undermine the incredible work of single parents. And, you know, and I'm sort of echoing um, what Kay said early in terms of the Dibble Institute's perspective. But, you know, I think we all just have the most respect um, and admiration for the single parents out there. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, lesbian parents do, you know, can do a phenomenal job. But what we were focused on proving and demonstrating is that, you know, having a father in your life really matters and uh, is incredibly valuable. Uh, next slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am not a fan of the dead, the dead stereotype, and uh, I imagine that many of you aren't as well. Um, and I think it's just incredibly dated. I think that whenever, you know, these are basic sort of, I, I'm Jewish, so you come across this basic concept in the Torah where, you know, just asking people to, you know, really fully look at a situation before they judge. And I think that's incredibly important when looking at disadvantaged fathers, because um, I think our tendency still in society is to value the mother's role above all else. And, you know, while of course that is incredibly uh, crucial to a child's well-being, um, I think we're still in a time where we're kind of overly critical of fathers that we don't think quite measure up to our standards. And I think we have a very narrow understanding of what a good father is. And so, you know, although a lot of people, you know, we don't commonly hear the dead be dead uh, term anymore, I think that its vestiges are still very much with us. And, you know, you definitely see this in the family law uh, scenario in that um, basically dads are often discriminated against. And there's even, you know, there's a strong preference to place children with their mothers even if the mothers uh, really don't seem um, as, as good a fit to parent a, as the fathers. So fathers in the sort of family court system are really working against a lot of biases. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of times there's a preference to put place a child with grandparents over the father, uh, aunts over the father, um, and sometimes there's good reason for that, um, but we definitely, in making the film, came across a lot of sort of discriminatory uh, treatment of disadvantaged dads, and we're hoping the film, you know, will help kind of mitigate that. 
um, and show that a lot of these guys really want to be present for their children, but a lot of times, you know, there's socioeconomic circumstances going on that, that hinder their ability to do that. Um, and it's not just that they're selfish or they don't care, they don't love their kids. It's that there's other factors going on in their lives that really hold them back from fathering, you know, much like in my grandfather's situation. Where, Excuse me, Emily, I'm going to step yeah. in here. We um, just have 20 minutes left, so you might want to move on with the slides a little bit more. Okay, I will speed up. Yeah. Um, so, so, okay, speaking of that, next slide. <laughs> um, so nowadays, uh, uh, dual career families are the norm. Um, women are the primary breadwinners in 40% of homes. Um, and uh, basically, you know, men are oftentimes the caregivers just as much as women are. And, uh, you know, from, I can just chime in on a personal level in my home, uh, my husband and I split everything 50-50. So finances, childcare, um, housekeeping, it's all 50-50. And I have many, many friends in similar circumstances. Um, and, you know, the, the meaning of fatherhood is just really, really changing. And so we feel like Daddy Don't Go is, is part of this fatherhood movement um, that, that uh, is sort of sweeping the country and, and the world. Um, so, okay, next slide. Um, a huge factor in a man's ability to parent in a traditional sense and sort of a, a breadwinner um, type of uh, um, manner is um, is uh, hindered when when they can't find employment, obviously. And um, there's unemployment is a huge problem in the states. And I think that what we wanted people to embrace, what the idea we want people to embrace when they see the film is that, you know, how can we encourage men to be present for their children? even if they feel like they fall short in that sort of traditional breadwinner sense. Um, and I will touch on this again in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and before, actually, before I get into these catchphrases, let's do uh, the uh, first, I realize I, I skipped over some poll questions. So let's do the first poll, questions one to three. So you can see the poll on your screen and take a quick moment to answer it and then Kathy will close it and show us what everybody thinks. Okay, great. Yeah, so I just want to show you this because just to my point that fatherlessness really matters and is a growing issue. Um, and I guess you all agree um, and I'll already know that. Um, so that's why I wanted to ask you that question. The next one. So what factor showed the strongest correlation with economic mobility? Income inequality, family structure, or racial segregation? And Emily, is that right? Family structure is the... Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why I wanted you guys to see this because, um, you know, it's a little surprising actually that income inequality isn't uh, the sort of strongest factor in whether or not a child kind of succeeds financially. Uh, but it's not. It's actually family structure. 
So again, this whole issue of fatherlessness really, really does matter and really does impact children. Um, let's do the next poll. So this is about how much more likely are, are children with fathers versus without fathers carrying guns and dealing drugs. Emily, is this the right answer? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's 279% more likely, which I just found so shocking and, uh, you know, just really speaks to how much this issue affects um, children and specifically uh, boys. Um, and uh, something to remember when we're we're dealing with families um, that you know it's it's very valuable to have a father in the home. Um, then can we quickly do the I want to catch up a little bit. Could we do uh, poll number four? This is sort of about who you guys are. Just some information for, for me. OK, excellent. So a lot of you are you know doing the direct service you're in the field um and so about half of you are interacting directly with dads uh like the ones in my movie and then uh about half of you are dealing with them indirectly so again i'm just incredibly honored to be uh speaking to you today and um i'm sure many of you could uh host this webinar better than myself, <laughs> um, uh, but hopefully you'll uh, get something out of my sort of um, my, my experience. And I think, you know, again, the perspective that I'm speaking from is, is one of a former caseworker and one of someone who deeply cares about this issue and um, from someone who I don't want to say lived with, but who spent many, many, many hours uh, and sort of got to know intimately these these four disadvantaged dads over you know a few years. So, you know, take take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Uh, it's really based on my personal experience, um, but hopefully you'll find some of my observations valuable. Um, so. My, my team and I kind of came up with this phrase as, as a joke, but I really, uh, it was sort of a humorous thing, but I really think it, there's a lot of truth in it, which is that um, there's a comparison to be made between uh, disadvantaged fathers uh, and, and cast iron marshmallows. So what, what do I mean by that? And I don't mean that in any kind of patronizing sense. Um, I actually mean it in a flattering way in that um, a lot of these guys we found were very tough on the outside uh, and kind of sweet and gooey on the inside. Um, and basically, you know, they really, really fiercely loved their children, but also sometimes acted out of a place of sort of wounded pride. Um, and I think the the worst thing that you can do with disadvantaged dads is is make assumptions about them or their situations, um, or humiliate them or embarrass them in any way, um, because the bottom line is that they already feel really bad about their situations. So more criticism is kind of salt to the wound. And they will often protect themselves from that pain by fleeing. Um, and I experienced, I, I was always hearing things like this from the men I worked with. In, I, I also made a, a documentary called Take It From Me that was about uh, four of my former clients as they transitioned from welfare to work. And through that film, I, and following those women's stories, I was also uh, around their partners a lot. And I, I still remember this guy, Louie, saying to me, you know, 
I, I can't find a job. I feel like I can't feed my family. And sometimes that just makes us guys feel like bouncing, you know, and like going to live a dangerous life. And I think that sentiment is, is very much there that, you know, the average guy feels like a failure if they can't provide for their family in a traditional way. And it's up to us, the people who want to really, you know, draw them in and keep them close to their families to, to help change their minds about that and to not define, you know, what, what good fatherhood is in such a limited and narrow, narrow way. Um, okay, next slide. So, <clears throat> Emily, just so you know, there's 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, similarly, you know, this idea of no shame in this game, you know, a lot, the worst thing you can do is embarrass a, a dad. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of emphasis on child support and the money side of parenting. And obviously, that's very important. Um, but I think we also have to realize that uh, some dads out there just don't have the money to give. You know, it's not that they're being greedy or selfish. Uh, they just don't have it. So uh, if we can step away from shaming them around their financial situation, uh, that's, that's a very good thing. Um, and, you know, just back to my grandfather's story, um, I think the shame around his situation just made him completely absent and the system uh, reinforced that. And so that's why my dad never saw him again after that fateful court date. Um, I think it's so important for uh, dads to feel heard and seen, you know, and that we teach moms and partners to value these guys uh, for what they are, not, not what they aren't. Um, and, you know, along these lines, I think we all know it's, it's very toxic when, um, when dads get, get bad mouthed by their partners. Um, uh, so keeping the communication positive and supportive is super important. Um, next, next slide. Uh, some is better than none. Uh, this is a motto in my own life. I have uh, two young daughters, age six and eight. And that was actually a real sort of bond between me and the, and the dads in the movie as we were all raising young kids. And um, I think that was part of what really enabled us to have the access we did. That was a real point of connection. You know, we all loved our kids, trying to do the best for our kids. And for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, it's not always easy to make a good living <laughs> as a filmmaker, um, but you know, I'm 50%, I, you know, responsible for my, uh, family's income. And so what I tell myself is, you know, some is better than none. So, you know, instead of, uh, as a parent, you know, we're often really hard on ourselves about what we can and can't do. Um, and similarly, you know, disadvantaged dads really take that to heart and often feel very bad about, you know, not being able to provide a lot of birthday presents, Christmas presents. But I think getting disadvantaged dads to see that, you know, some is better than none, you know, you being in your child's life on the weekends is better than none at all. You know, you uh, sitting down and doing homework with your kid a couple of times a week, that's much better than um, you not being part of your child's educational life at all. So that kind of message. Um, uh, next slide. Um, uh, I love this term. Actually, this is something that Omar used to say, you know, what matters most is not what's in a father's pocket, but what's in his heart. Um, again, you know, valuing these men uh, for, you know, what they can really contribute in a, in a, in a full sense um, and realizing that, you know, the financial piece is just a small piece of, uh, of a father's role um, and the next slide, time is a currency of love. If I, if I could, you know, tattoo, I'm not into tattoos, but if I was, I, this is the tattoo I would get. Um, 
because that's that's how you show your child you love them that's how they feel loved uh is by you know really putting in the time and so with disadvantaged dads they may not have a lot of resources financially um but that means that but they they might have time you know especially if they're unemployed and if mom works then why doesn't dad sort of shift into more of a um being a more hands-on uh child care provider you know so just keeping that in mind um okay next slide uh you know dads need tools and inspiration to succeed um so you know this is sort of obvious um but i just wanted to speak for a moment about roy's story in that you know i saw him really grow and evolve a lot from the counseling services that he got at forestdale and i think whenever you can put disadvantaged dads in a room together or whenever there's an opportunity for um you know kind of mentoring between fathers uh that really matters and is super valuable it's sort of like why aa is so effective it's like you know people see themselves in other stories and those stories are very empowering and healing so um you know obviously women caseworker women in these men lives are very important but i think that i really witnessed um the the men in disadvantage in uh, daddy don't go really thriving when they could get the counseling of uh specifically male mentors who were also fathers it seemed to really affect them um i think you know any opportunity to provide disadvantaged dads with job training um you know resources around employment all of that is super valuable um also you know enabling disadvantaged dads to be generous with their kids so i was often you know i never of course i never gave any of the dads um money to appear in the film but i would every once in a while give them gift certificates that they could use for their kids you know um coupons to to that you give a dad to take his kids to the movies, things like that, uh, events that celebrate fatherhood, inspirational speakers who've been through similar journeys, all those things really, really give dads the tools and, and inspiration to, to succeed. So when you're putting together events, I highly recommend that kind of thing. Um, and I know I need to wrap up. Um, well, can we go to the slide where you talk about, let's just go straight to the slide um, with how to use the film, because we yeah. just have a few more minutes. Yeah. These slides, everybody, will be posted when we archive the uh, webinar. So here we go. Uh, why don't you go go to here, Emily? Yeah, and, and the previous slides um, were just all uh, sort of ways that you could use the film uh, to help empower disadvantaged dads. But, uh, just a few kind of tricks of the trade that we've learned over the years and hosting screenings uh, is to, you know, give dads plenty of time to discuss their feelings afterwards. Um, you know, take advantage of our discussion guide, which um, Kay is going to post for your use. Um, there's lots of questions in there and, um, you know, valuable information that could be helpful. Uh, inviting local experts and other community partners can be helpful. Um, we would love to participate um the daddy don't go dads are for hire as am i and um we we love to to uh be a part of screenings and events and oftentimes it's very inspiring uh for disadvantaged dads to actually meet the dads in the film so that's pretty much it and i again i'm super honored to connect with all of you um and i really hope you see the film and use it in your incredibly important work. Great, thank you. So Kathy, keep going with a couple of the last slides because someone just haven't. So here's next steps with Daddy Don't Go as, as Emily has made clear and I fully support, you know, this is a movie that is available for people to see. Um, you have to purchase it. And you can see, we will, we will post this so you'll be able to see how to see the trailer and to learn more about the background of the film 
and you can rent or buy or stream or have someone rent or buy or stream on your behalf, maybe the local United Way, maybe the local library. Um, lots of good ways to be able to bring this into your programming, not only with your fathers, but with your stakeholders, with your boards, with people in the community, so they can really hear the stories of fathers and understand the important work that you in the fatherhood field are doing. Kathy, the next um, other resources are uh, the National Fatherhood Initiative has great materials, 24-7 dad and, and brochures and other resources. Uh, another fatherhood program is On My Shoulders from Prep Inc. And um, the Dibble Institute, we have published a program called Love Notes, which is especially good with young fathers who are you know, adolescent to young in their 20s, really helping them grappling with issues around <clears throat> their goals and their lives and their children. Emily, how long is the film? It is uh, 70 minutes. Okay, I believe. Great. No, 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 no. It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's 79 minutes. 79 minutes. Great. So we will, um, when, so thank you for joining us. If you have questions, email us. We have your questions and we will respond to those if we haven't gotten to them uh, by now. You will get links uh, to the archive and on there we will have all the um, links to the trailers and the, we'll have them in text so you can find them. We'll make it really easy for you along with the discussion guides and, and an exhaustive uh, reference list that, that Emily put together for this film. So here's how to keep in touch with us. If you're new to us, please subscribe to our newsletter and we keep people abreast of funding opportunities, new um, research, new programs, all kinds of tools. And finally, next month, um, we're going to have a great program from the University of Kansas, uh, who are putting together a really sustainable pregnancy prevention program model. And we hope you all join us on March 14th. And until then, we appreciate you coming. And thank you, Emily, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you.